A specter is haunting America, everybody. The specter of communism. I'm Noah Kurtzivik, and with me is my close friend uh, and our brother, Carlos Garrido. And welcome to another live stream from the Midwest of Marx Institute for Marxist Theory and Political Analysis. Tonight, we're going to be discussing the book that changed the world. The Communist Manifesto by Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. And by the way, do not say Frederich, all right, if you're American. It's Frederick, right? You, you just sound like one of those guys who says croissant when he means croissant, right? Ain't going to fly with us. Anyway, we're going to be discussing the Communist Manifesto, why it's still so important today, uh, what, all, what all sort of misconceptions develop around it, and believe me, there are a lot, and why uh, we should still be reading it, understanding it, and knowing what Marx and Engels mean in it, even in the uh, USA of 2024. And we're going to be doing all that right after the international. <laughs> no better way to get the day started than with the glorious international. Um, for those that have been follow on, following us, you should know that we have been demonetized by YouTube. We were demonetized last month. It was one of the central sources of funding for the Midwestern Marx Institute. Um, not only did they demonetize us, but they uh, took away the 900 plus dollars that you guys had uh, donated to us in the first 14 or so days of February which is just absolutely criminal. Um, but uh, I, I wanted to let you all know that we have put a donation link for those interested, willing, and financially capable. It's pinned to the YouTube uh, version of this live stream to the top of it. You can send us donations there. You can also become a Patreon at patreon.com slash Midwestern Marks, which is the most consistent way to support us. And if you're considering doing a donation, there's a chat option when you can input a question and throughout the stream, we'll be checking the incoming uh, donations uh, uh, questions and we'll be answering them as if they are super chats because of course that function has been removed. Um, but without further ado, Noah, how are you doing today, brother? I'm great. It's uh, been a frustrating day as as uh, <laughs> you know, brother. Uh, we We've been working on this transition over to new uh streaming software and i kind of just watched it all fall apart into pieces in front of me earlier today and trying to pick them up and put them back where they belong and we ended up just going to the old software and finding a few temporary workarounds because our production team is currently uh unavailable for this sort of work but other than that i'm good um I've been doing quite a lot of, uh, of study recently on political economy. And I think this is one of the things that, that a lot of people don't understand um, about Marx and why he is important. It's because he went from philosophy to political economy. It's the worldview that shapes him and how he thinks and how he views everything happening in the world 
that informs his analysis of political, uh, political economy, we like to sort of separate him into little metaphysical different Marxes, right? But he would call that metaphysics, right? He would say that you need to understand uh, him in his development. And so uh, in order to write my book on reproletarianization, I'm trying to, you know, do a much dumber version of what Marx did in the transition from learning the materialist dialectic to learning about political economy. And when you do that, uh, a lot of the times you, you, you go back through capital for something and you look at something a new way and you realize, oh my God, I really didn't understand what Marx was saying before, right? I didn't understand what he even meant by, you know, an abstraction and what, what value uh, being concrete or the concept of value even being concrete even means. Uh, and now I do. And, and I think it's important to have both of those. If you don't have both, you don't have Marxism. How about you? <laughs> yeah, well, f foundationally, what Marxism is, is a philosophy. It is a worldview, a comprehensive um, way of thinking about everything in the world, a way of thinking about um, questions, ontological questions, questions about the composition uh, of, of being or of being understood as becoming. So how the world really is, this is where the claims pertaining to the dialectics of nature are, are rooted in and which is never separated in Marx or Engels' work. There is always a consciousness that the dialectic is operative in nature, in society, and in, and in human thinking. This is something that the Western Marxists break with um, quite sharply, I think, to the detriment of understanding uh, the world. But yeah, it's, uh, it's very easy, especially in the age of academic specialization, where everything is so extremely specialized and divorced from everything else, uh, to forget that um, you know there's there's a, a philosophical outlook at the foundation of this, and if we come at it straight without having that background in philosophy that Marx is operating with, uh, we lend uh, we put ourselves in a position where we can easily misunderstand what's what's being said. Um, and I don't think uh, if for those of you that are starting to read these texts, don't be afraid of of misunderstandings. I think that the knowledge process, just like everything else, is a dialectical process. It is a process. It's not just, boom, you're hit with a moment of enlightenment. Unless you're Gautama Siddhartha, uh, i.e. Buddha, <laughs> you get hit with a moment of enlightenment and boom, now you know all of uh, the Marxist-Leninist worldview. For all of us, it's a process. Yeah, that would be nice. That would be really nice, <laughs> right? Or like the, the matrix chips that they could just put in your brain and boom, you just develop a, a skill. Right, right. Well, all of a sudden you're like, oh, there is no spoon. And then you understand the ascension of the concrete and everything else. Yeah, yeah. And, and you br personally bring about communism and everybody's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can dodge uh, bullets too, by the way. That's one of the powers that Marxism Leninism gives mm -hmm. you, by the way. That's what Neo was. Um, but, you know, that's not how the world works. Learning is a, is a process, which means that... Um, you're going to necessarily, in your first readings of it, misunderstand parts of it. And that is absolutely fine. Uh, just continue to go back to it, to interact with other uh, related things from the classics, to read secondary material, to engage with educational formats that are adapt to the new means of, of learning and ideological production such as these. Um, and eventually your knowledge of these areas will concretize as the uh, the area itself suggests, you know, all knowledge, all genuine knowledge of the whole of, of, of that which is comprehensive and concrete is an ascension. Um, so you can't start directly where, where you're going to end. Um, you have to start in a, in, a, in a learning position and work your way up towards it. So um, I want to say uh, the inspiration uh, for, for, for this discussion is kind of twofold. Uh, one, we had the anniversary of the death of Karl Marx, March 14, which was earlier uh, this week. Um, of course, I, I think the most influential thinker of the modern world, perhaps all of human history. Um, uh, so that's a, a good context to go back to one of the most uh, influential texts that, that him and Engels uh, wrote. I think it's one of the most translated uh, pieces of literature ever um, created. Um, by the way, there's an interesting uh, fun fact that, that comes out of the, 
most authoritative uh, angles biography in the West comes from Terrell Carver, which is a 70s biography that has just recently been upgraded. Uh, Carver suggests that perhaps it should be a uh, manifesto of the Communist Party by Frederick Engels and Karl Marx. Because <laughs> um, as a close student of Engels' early writings, uh, he says that it, it resembles a lot more Engels' writing style, the sorts of metaphors that, that he was using uh, than it does the Marx at that time, which was a lot more obscure of a thinker, um, still embedded within um, some of the writing styles and jargons of the young Hegelians that he was already breaking with for a couple of years. But uh, Engels was definitely a much lucid, much more lucid uh, writer. But either way, Marx, Engels, Engels, Marx, it doesn't matter. Um, the other occasion that I, I think was uh, a, an interesting coincidence besides the death of Marx to bring about this discussion was the fact that in my history of, of, of Western philosophy course, uh, this upcoming week is the one where we'll be discussing the manifesto. So I've been preparing my PowerPoints and my lecture notes, and uh, I, I felt that what better uh, use of those than, than to employ them here in this uh, wonderful discussion with my colleague. Yeah. Um, the one thing about when we're originally learning these things and uh, the fact that making mistakes is okay. The one thing I'd caution you against is believing you know something and then running all over social media, using it to sort of inflate your ego, right? Like you see something you believe is wrong and you are like, it's my job to tell them how wrong they are and make them feel stupid. And I, I'm going to feel awesome about this, right? And you can even make up fantasies about they what, what they think or whatever it is. Don't do that. A year or two down the line, you're going to be looking back at that going, oh, God, I can't take it all off the Internet. I wish I could. Believe me, take it from a guy who's been there. When I was in my early 20s, I thought I knew everything and I knew very close to nothing. So just a little tip, but on the, on the manifesto, and I think this is one of the things that people really – uh, underestimate about Engels is his linguistic ability and his editing ability. He was the man who could edit Marx and take all of that sort of philosophical shorthands that Marx develops on his own as he goes away from the uh, young Hegelians and the entire uh, German classical philosophy school, right? He takes all that and brings it down to earth, right? Where where to, to put it in a joke that Lengels, or Lenin uses translates it into regular human language, right? Uh, um, and that's hard to do uh, when, when you're sort of writing in order to be understood rather than for, you know, you to get your ideas out in a way that you know they're out there. Right, you're always writing so someone else can understand what you're communicating, getting across. And I actually recently did a post on Twitter about the a very basic breakdown on the the dialectics of, of linguistics and language and and what the problems with definition mongering is. And we're going to get into a little bit of definition mongering uh, and why it's incorrect as we go through the manifesto. Uh, tonight, but uh, I don't want to waste any more time. Y'all didn't, you know, come here to hear me yap about language. You came here for the manifesto, so why don't why don't you lead us into that, brother? Yes. Um, by the way, on definitions, my my recent Substack. Uh, if if you haven't subscribed already, make sure you do. Um, it's philosophy in crisis, um, and it's got a dual meaning because philosophy is itself in crisis, and we are in crisis doing philosophy very necessary thing to do while while we're in crisis um, is precisely on that topic. You know, why Marxists find definitions problematic um, and the abstract character of definitions and how sometimes they, they harm uh, thinking. Um, uh, Dino asked, uh, why were you demonetized? Well, we were demonetized. Um, they haven't been very specific. They're very obscure with, with some of these things. But uh, the few suggestions that we were able to receive was 
um, that it was rooted in Google AdSense, which is the format that YouTube uses to, to pay its uh, creators, um, and that uh, it's connected to our coverage of uh, the proxy war against Russia. Specifically, it happened the day that we were covering um, the death of Navalny and challenging, as we always do, the narratives of imperialism, which are uh, used, of course, in order to fabricate um, evil demons that we're supposed to uh, support the, the fight against and, and support our imperialist uh, fathers in, in waging that war against them. So, uh, oh, Carlos, I thought we had freedom of speech. <laughs> freedom, democracy, independence, individualism, all of these things, as we'll see today in the discussion of, of the manifesto, are very much rooted in a, in a class conception of the world. It's freedom for the bourgeoisie. It's freedom understood as free markets. Freedom understood as the freedom of the owners of capital to exploit and to exploit not just because they're bad guys, you know, Jeff Bezos and Musk don't do what they do just because they're assholes um, who wake up every day on the wrong side of the bed and want to suck the value that workers produce. They do it systematically. They have to. They're personifications of capital and they must do it. It's the in the very nature and the very essence of capital as a specific form of relation to accumulate. You can't have capital if you don't have that process of accumulation. So um, it's absolutely indispensable to it. And uh, by the way, thank you so much to Chance Pope, who who uh, threw us three bucks into the donations uh, through PayPal. For anyone interested, if you're watching us on, on YouTube, you can see, um, you can donate to us through the link that's pinned on the on the chat. You can donate straight through PayPal, but I, I think PayPal allows you to use pretty much any payment method um, you want in order to do that. And you can throw a question in there if you'd like, and, and we'll address it uh, at an according moment in the in the discussion. Um, but I think uh, you know to get started on on the discussion, which we hope to contain it to uh, the first couple chapters, if there's time to to, to chapter two, but uh, specifically chapter one, which is a very meaty chapter. There's a lot going on here, a lot of misconceptions that will eventually develop uh, being dispelled, um, just as they are in chapter two. Marx's, Marx and Engels are, are a lot more explicit about debunking some of the misconceptions that are already developing at their time, um, specifically in chapter two with the question of the family, property, etc. But I think one of the most uh, unnoticed uh, parts of the manifesto or overlooked even by people within our tradition is how the first sentence is formulated. It's a very historic sentence. It's one of the most memorable sentences of any text written by any human being in history, which is that the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. That last part is not class struggle singular. It's class struggles precisely because Marx and Engels, thanks to the philosophy that they're rooting, that they're rooted in and developing. Um, understand that what makes something universal is not, as Western philosophy traditionally thought, uh, its ability to exist in the same way at all times, uh, regardless of context and, and, and space and time. But on the contrary, what makes something universal, it's its unique capacity to determine itself, to concretize itself, to actualize itself in different forms in accordance with different times. So this statement, this universal statement, the history of all hit earth or existing societies is the history of class struggles, plural. It's letting us know that all throughout written history, which is what they mean by hit earth or existing society, there's a clarification by Engels in uh, most of the recent copies in, in the footnotes that he clarifies what they mean by this. Um, most of this written history of humanity has been governed by various forms of struggles surrounding specifically the property question and questions of ownership. And um, Engels shows us in the origins of the family, private property, and the state, how that first struggle took the form of the struggle against patriarchy. It was the struggle against, uh, it, it was the woman's struggle against the specific form of family that developed precisely in order for private property to be handed down, and that then created uh, the conditions for the possibility of the state. Um, 
we've also here emphasized that at the Institute using the work of Du Bois, which is the fourth head of Marxism that we have in, in the background, W.B. Du Bois, Dr. W.B. Du Bois, that one of these central forms that the class struggle has taken, one of the specific uh, leading determinant forms of the class struggle here in the U.S. has been the struggle against racism. Racism, which is what Marx called that poison that the ruling class uses. It's, it's secret that the ruling class uses in order to divide workers. So when the uh, academics that are working within an ABC, anything but class theory framework, tell you that it's, it's race or it's gender, or it's all of these different things, they're obfuscating from the reality that it's actually class and it's class taking different forms in different contexts in accordance with different um, historically constituted forms of struggle. Precisely. Uh, that, that's exactly what he means. And he sort of, uh, I mean, the manifesto is so concise and so perfectly to the point, to the next point, to the next point that he doesn't have time to really get into any of these things. But he breaks into a little bit about this um, in when he talks about the, the, the class struggle first having to be national in form it, and not in content. And people don't really get what he means by this. In fact, even the ultra lefts of Lenin's day, uh, like Lud Luxembourg and Tr Trotsky, didn't quite get what he meant by this. Lenin goes further, and then Stalin, actually, who uh, Losurdo says was the like height of theory on the national question and the materiality of nations, and he's absolutely correct about that. He goes even further. Basically, though, class struggle is this universal that can't but happen in every situation as society moves and changes the forms it takes move and change following the way society has changed right so as uh the particular form of uh, uh, of capitalism hits russia right uh it take the class struggle takes a certain form in first the peasant revolts right, against the Kosygin reforms, the organization of the SRs and the cadets, and then finally the Bolsheviks, right? This is the form it took. And then compare that to the, the American history, right? As uh, America throws out the British occupier and starts sort of forming itself as America, the American people begin establishing themselves, right? We have what they, the bourgeoisie used to um, sort of cheekily call that peculiar institution, meaning the barbaric pra practice of human slavery, right? Based on race. And this prompts a different form of class struggle, right? It, it uh, prompts the struggle that we call the struggle against the color line. Uh, following, you know, the father of American Marxism, Du Bois, W.E.B. Du Bois. And this leads us, uh, just as it led the Bolsheviks to the October Revolution, this leads us to the end of the Civil War and the revolution of the freedmen or the ex-slaves, right? And the beginning of Reconstruction, which Marx won't comment on uh, very, very in-depth, but Du Bois does. Uh, as the first ever dictatorship of the proletariat in his in human history, like so, the first organization of the proletariat for and of itself, right, or of and for itself rather, and they begin uh, administrating for themselves with the backing of the Union Army. This is what we call Reconstruction or the Reconstruction of Democracy. What is this in actual substantive fact, but a class struggle, right? Um, the working class union soldiers and the freedmen who uh, uh, were proletarians, right? Against the slaveocracy, against a very particular faction of the bourgeoisie. And after there's this, what we call the counter-revolution of property, 
this institutes a new era and this class struggle changes form again. But it's still that class struggle against the, the color line. And it's still, uh, this is our national form of class struggle that Marx talks about, right? That it's not uh, national or in content. If it was, it would end at that nation. Mm -hmm. But it's happening everywhere, right? In essence, it's universal. But in each form, each particular that it arises, it's national. So that's what he means by that. I'm sorry about the long-winded uh, thing. I know we got a lot to get to. Uh, no, that that was uh, excellent, and um, that's you know, uh, interestingly enough, that's <laughs> part of what we're doing right now is 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 helping us understand Marxism not just as this general thing, but Marxism within the context of the specific struggles that have occurred in the U.S. We're giving. Marxism, a national form, which is the only form it could really take of it all to be successful, a form that actually analyzes concretely the concrete uh, struggles and the concrete situation and histories that we have at hand and that we're building off of. One of the interesting points... Real, real quick, before you get to that, that's going to lead right to a great answer to this question. You're uh, looking for Black Reconstruction, black reconstruction. in America. That's the, the main e. one. Yeah. Yes. I also have an academic paper that uh, I can link um, uh, for you all that's uh, fairly long. It's not book length, maybe pamphlet length, uh, but where I flesh out the Institute's ideas on, on Du Bois and, um, and the importance of the struggle against the color line as the determinate form the class struggle has taken in the US. Uh, but uh, one of the things that's conjoined with this discussion about the universal character of class struggles um, within uh, class society specifically, um, is the fact that it doesn't just uh, stay there um, universally. It always leads to uh, either two outcomes, one of which is a revolution, which, um, you know, today this word revolution is tossed so uh, frequently. There's revolutions in diets. You can be in publics or if you're in the South, uh, or, or Kroger, if you're in the Midwest, yeah. hy -Vee. Revolutionary uh, new dog shampoo, yeah. Revolutionary new dog, it's, it's, they use revolution for, for anything, for, for anything and everything. Um, what, in, in social sciences, when we're analyzing society, what a revolution means is, is quite simple. It means that a new class has came into a position of political power. There has been a transfer of political power from one class to another. A revolution is not when the Republicans lose and the Democrats win. A revolution is not when Bernie wins, um, even though Bernie was uh, claiming to, to be carrying forth a political revolution, which is a distinction that, that we can make. It's not a social general revolution. It's, a, it's a, a, a partial revolution, if you wish to refer to it like that. Um, that stays within the confines of the struggle for democracy within the specific mode of life in which uh, one is in. But a revolution, the essence, of <laughs> the essence of a revolution is found in the conquest of political power from one class to another, which then remolds all of society, uh, the state, the state institutions, the ideological institutions. So we're talking about the church, we're talking about the family, which is an institution itself, we're talking about schools, et cetera. Um, the economic institutions, of course, the foundation of society, the relations of production. Um, it remolds the form of life as a whole or the mode of life as a whole um, in such a way that allows for the reproduction of the condition in which that class holds that supremacy, in which that class holds that position of economic, political, social, cultural, ideological dominance. Um, so when we speak about a bourgeois revolution, what we're talking about is the process of the bourgeoisie, this nascent uh, former middle class uh, that comes into a position of, uh, of supremacy and shapes the whole form of life um, in its image, which is an expression that, uh, that, that Marx uses when he's talking about the spread of capitalism across the world, the globalization of capitalism, which is a, a term that's quite popular uh, today. Um, it, fashions it in its own image and um it's it's 
that that phrase in its own image, I, I think it has very interesting theological slash theological critique undertones. Because, um, of course, in the Christian tradition, we have the idea of the Imago Dei, of us being created in the image of God. And the Feuerbachian critique, which, of course, Marx is extremely familiar with and, and a, a follower of and developer of, uh, it flips that. It says that, no, it is God that is created in the image of humanity. So there's something very interesting going on when he tells us later on that capitalism uh, seeks to shape the world in its own image in the process of, of globalizing and, and going abroad. But you have one outcome of these struggles, which is a revolution, which is the one we're hoping for, you know. Um, but there's another outcome, which is the common ruin of all classes, the common dissolution of, of society, which is always possible. Um, and which uh, I think the most classic example is the collapse of the Roman Empire. Yeah. Um, and, and I think people sort of don't really think about uh, about that. And it's one of the, oh, shit. Go, go, just go. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, by the way, I wanted to thank a couple of you, um, actually three now. I wanted to thank Karina Valdivieso. Uh, my apologies if I'm pronouncing that uh, last name incorrectly, for the $10 donation to the Midwestern Marx Institute. I want to also thank Gloria Carroll. Thank you so much for the $25. That's a huge donation. Thank you so much, Gloria. $25 donation for the Institute. And also Yoga with Steph for the $5 uh, donation to the Institute. Also remember to feel free to, to shoot us a, a question with these donations. These are, again, extremely appreciated, uh, especially after our, our demonetization on the part of Google AdSense slash YouTube. And again, you can find uh, where to donate uh, in the uh, chat of the YouTube live stream. It's pinned at the top, so you can you can donate there or you can become a Patreon at patreon.com slash Midwestern Marks. Um, one of the things that Marx notices, Marx and Engels uh, notice that is uh, central or distinctive to the capitalist mode of life is that it makes these class antagonisms, these, these battles and, and, and tensions and unities of opposites, uh, these contradictions that exist within uh, these various forms of class societies, it makes it more acute. It simplifies the class antagonism by splitting society primarily into two major camps, the camp of the owners of capital um, and the camp of the people that are forced to sell uh, their labor power because it's all they have in order to survive and and that uh, sell that labor power not as the bourgeois ideologue suggests voluntarily through this voluntary uh, contract uh, uh, consensual exchange but through the uh, economic power the mute compulsion as marx refers to it in capital of the economic system itself, which propels us on the basis of the fact that if we don't work, we don't eat, we don't have shelter, we don't survive. It forces us to sell that labor power in order to uh, survive. So one of the things that's distinctive about the capitalist mode of life is that it makes these antagonisms, these contradictions, this class struggle more acute and it makes it more uh, clear, uh, the division uh, that exists in society, the fragmentation of society into uh, the property owners and the property less uh, workers. Now, this doesn't mean, as people have misinterpreted, uh, some from the standpoint of being so-called friends of, of Marxism and others being explicitly hostile enemies of Marxism and the, the project of socialist construction, this doesn't mean that Marx thinks there's only two classes under capitalism. Um, that would be completely absurd. Marx is extremely clear about the fact uh, that there are other classes operative in society. Um, he talks about petty shopkeepers. He talks about the, the people who survive on the basis of self-earned private property. So, um, you know, for those libertarians that, that want to, you know, raise your chickens and, and sell your chicken eggs or have your mom and pop shop, Marx is not coming after you. He's not coming after the self-earned private property. Uh, he, in fact, sees that capitalism has already basically abolished that as the central form, uh, the dominant mode of production uh, 
and replaced it, of course, with mass uh, modern industry. Um, yeah. He he sees various other uh, classes operative, of course, the aristocracy and and these different uh, classes still exist, and he sees them uh, with the development of capitalism, uh, necessarily proletarianizing in various stages, and that proletarianization takes different forms. This is something that Noah has specifically developed uh, a unique form of proletarianization that we have uh, seen here in the U.S. What we've called re-proletarianization, but I'll toss it over to you, and I hope everything's okay. By the way, on your end. Yeah, I I have a a little soundboard that my this new microphone uh is plugged into and I spilled seltzer directly on it. So sorry about that guys, but I'm back now. Um exactly. called it by the way. <laughs> yeah, um so uh Mark's actually what he says directly on this and and the I it, which just, you know, makes it clear that people are incentivized to dismiss rather than actually learn the thing that they're being instructed to spend so much energy hating. Because what Marx says specifically, precisely, he says, we communists have been reproached with the desire of abolishing the right of personally acquiring property as the fruit of a man's own labor, which property is alleged to be the groundwork of all personal freedom, activity, and independence. Sounds like a libertarian, right? And he goes on, he says, Hard one, self acquired, self earned property. Do you mean the property of petty artisans and of small peasants? A form of property that preceded the bourgeois form? There's no need to abolish that. The development of industry is to a great extent already destroyed it and is still destroying it daily. And this was in Marx's day. Since then, it's only continued, right? Marxism doesn't. First of all, there's a, a, a misconception uh, about what abolition is in general. Marxism uh, it sort of helps us understand that there's no such thing as abolition as such. Abolition is at the same time its precise opposite, right? It is a moment of uh, positive creation, right? The abolition of the old is a creation of the new. Um, but in, in, in our day, most Americans, I think it's like 98%, I forget the exact, it's upwards of 90%, uh, have a zero or less than zero net worth. That means we have no property to speak of. Capitalism is what is robbing us of property. Communism is the solution. So for all the people that are so concerned with being able to own property, Capitalism is your enemy, not communism. If you look at the countries that have the leading percentage of people owning their homes, it's largely communist countries. Mm -hmm. Laos, uh, Cuba, China, etc. And it was the same thing with the Soviet Union. So these myths uh, are all dispelled in the manifesto. We're not coming for your personal property. Um, we're not coming for the petty, self-earned private property property of small business owners. In the instances in the past where small businesses, uh, small business owners have been repressed, it, it's been for political reasons, not for economic ones. It's been because they've uh, harbored sympathies with the reactionary forces that have done criminal activities in order to regain their power. So if you look at Cuba, you know how many small businesses, petty the petty bourgeoisie, identified with the brutal almost slave-like neo-colonial condition that Cubans were in under Bautista and all the puppet governments that came before the revolution. And when you're harboring criminals and people that are uh, taking uh, the young kids that are going out um, into the rural areas to bring education and to bring healthcare, develop health clinics, when you're murdering them, as you know, my grandfather has told me stories of, of what used to happen, he was in those brigades to educate the rural folks. Um, of course, it, you, you're going to be repressed. You're going to be jailed because that those are criminal actions. Um, but then they use the fact that they had a small business or something to say, oh, the government took away my small business. That's what socialism is all about. No, it's that's, complete bullshit. Yeah, it, 100%. That's what the, the kulaks were trying to say in the Soviet right. Union. And this is what, what really uh, sort of never adds up for the libertarians. The collective farms 
Those were all small businesses. Each of those was owned by the farmers of that farm. It wasn't owned by the state. They uh, collected their produce, did their farming, whatever, and then sold uh, whatever they could. And that money was theirs. This was their hard-earned, self-earned property or hard-won, self-earned, whatever Mark says. If, if people would actually take the time to try to understand this thing that mainstream media is just like instructing them like robots to hate. They go, oh, this makes a lot more sense than I thought. And Marx continues, by the way, explaining this very point in another amazing quote in this same uh, very tiny short book. He says that you're horrified and are intending to do away with this private property, right? But in your existing society, private property is already done away with. For 90% of the population, its existence for the few, that 10%, is solely due to its non-existence in the hands of those nine tenths at 90%. You mm -hmm. reproach us, therefore, with intending to do away with a form of property, the necessary condition for whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. In a word, you reproach us with intending to do away with your property. Precisely so, that's just what we intend. And that is what we intend. It is this specific form of property preventing all of the working masses from owning any property. Right? So if you're into wanting to own property, you want communism. That is what expands property so that you can actually own it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the central uh, components that, that Marx uh, and Engels see uh, as indispensable, integral to the development uh, of capitalism was the what he calls discovery of, of the new world. Of course, we know there wasn't really a discovery. Like, it was a discovery by the West because um, the Chinese had already uh, their cartographers, you know, centuries before, eight, eight centuries before that had already mapped the what the, the West came to call the new world, but the discovery of the new world within the context, context of an embryonically developed capitalism opened up the new markets and space that was needed for growth and that gave an impetus uh, for the development of the productive forces at home. It also gave it one of the solutions for the crises of overproduction that Marx uh, and Engels are going to speak about in the uh, second chapter um, as one of the uh, central contradictions uh, that's propelling uh, the the overcoming of the system, which is the fact that it enters these crises of overproduction, and it has two routes to go through. Either it destroys the things that have been produced and the means of production in some instances, or it is forced to expand into new markets and new contexts, which is, of course, uh, the centrality that we've seen for this mode of life of a distinctively capitalist form of colonialism, a distinctively capitalist form of modern imperialism, and then with the uh, flag independence, as as um, as has been called uh, in the uh, post so-called post-colonial world, with the form of neo-colonialism that that imperialism has 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 taken in the second half of the 20th century. One of the things that Marx is uh, Marx and Engels uh, are very clear on, which is absolutely indispensable because of the uh, the form of historical amnesia that bourgeois ideologues operate with is the fact that new modes of life do not come out of thin air. Uh, they weren't just here eternally. Uh, they're found in part already in embryo, uh, in, in seed form, implicitly in the previous forms of life. Uh, it was the, for instance, the contradictions, the internal unity of opposites, the opposing forces, uh, and constant tensions that uh, existed in the feudal order that developed the contradictions for the emergence of the bourgeoisie, the capitalist class. And eventually, uh, this class, once it, it developed a certain level of economic power, uh, confidence, uh, and, and, and power in general, it made that leap for political power, which creates uh, the modern state. And, and these leaps we've called the various revolutions, the glorious uh, revolution in the late 17th century in England, 
the American Revolution of 1776, the French Revolution, and many other revolutions that would come to create what is called in, in political philosophy and, and political science, the modern nation state, but which is, I think, more accurately called um, the modern capitalist uh, nation state. The bourgeois, uh, the, the, the developing or, or bourgeoning relations of, of capitalist uh, production uh, found themselves more fit for developing the productive forces um, and were therefore able to surpass and supplant the, fu the feudal relations of productions. Those closed guilds, uh, guilds which, which had a division of labor between the different corporate guilds found themselves unable to, um, to, um, to, to tarry with, unable to, uh, unable defeat, to keep up, unable to keep up with the division of labor that capitalism introduces within the workshop itself. And here a, a, a category that um, develops specifically out of uh, uh, neuroscience, um, or at least the context in which I've studied it develops out of neuroscience. I've written about it in uh, my uh, um, Marxism and, and, and the dialectical materialist uh, worldview, the introduction to that, the category of emergence, it's operative, which holds that um, when things come into a whole, they develop uh, as a whole new qualities that are not reducible neither to any specific part nor to the uh, uh, coming together to, to the um, uh, agglomeration. What, what's the, the word is slipping? Uh, agglomerate of all the parts put together um, to the sum of the parts. And uh, some of the examples that are provided are the fact that ant colonies can find the closest food source when they're uh, united in a colony, but they cannot do so uh, as independent ants. There's no amount of ants that you can see independently and, and bring their intellect together to find a food source, but they have that when they become a colony, when they become a whole. The same thing happens in production, and this is something that Marx uh, writes extensively on in the first chapter of Capital. When there's a division of labor introduced into manufacturing, there is an explosion in productivity because uh, 12 people working together in one workplace for 12 hours are more productive, scientifically speaking and, and, and provable. They're more productive than one individual working 12 days each day for 12 hours or 12 individuals working separately for 12 hours. It's that division of labor within manufacturing that is fundamental for why it is that capitalism is able to uh, develop the productive forces, it's also going to be fundamental uh, for Marx and Engels in thinking about how it is that capitalism already creates in this process of concentrating the working class within the shop floor, within the factories. Uh, it creates the conditions for its own abolition because working class people are going to be uh, in close contact with each other and the capacity for developing some form of consciousness of their class and their class's potential uh, will naturally arise so you have, uh, just uh, real quick to, to close out on, on this specific point, um, you have these series of positive feedback, feedback loops, the so-called discovery of the Americas that opens up new markets, the division of labor within manufacturing, uh, the developments of various machineries or means of productions, the steam engine and other forms of new uh, machinery, uh, the cotton spinning wheel, et cetera. And all of this uh, propels uh, the uh, capitalist class, which is the personification of these developments, into a position of uh, dominance. Uh, it's the group that controls uh, and owns the means of production. In other words, in, in legal terms, it's the one that uh, actually owns private property, that actually owns capital, which, as we mentioned earlier, is a relationship that's based on accumulation. And this class's economic development, which occurs within the womb of feudalism, reflects itself and corresponds to its political development as a class. Uh, as it develops as the dominant economic force in uh, society, it also begins to show itself as the dominant political force that's capable of creating a state, ideological institutions, uh, school, uh, a certain religious conceptions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's able to create those in its image. So its development as an economic force produces, gives the impetus for its development as a political force, its development as an ideological force, et cetera. And what else does this make? This creates the modern proletariat. 
as, as Marx calls it at the time, right? Um, the the necessity of the creation of people that that can all that are in a position where they have to work for uh, these capitalists that own the means of production, right? They have to sell their labor as a commodity. And there's like a very deeper, a much deeper sort of theoretical understanding that he lays out in capital of this. But just as a sort of like gist of it, what he's, what he's doing is that uh, in the, in the manifesto, Marx is explaining why the proletariat is the revolutionary agent of this form of society, right? That the bourgeoisie needs to uh, sort of um, create this proletariat or it isn't a bourgeoisie, it won't, it can't accumulate capital, right? And I really like that as he's describing all this, he says that uh, at the end of the day, what the, the bourgeoisie really creates are its own grave diggers because um, this proletariat, it's sort of, always forced into this situation because it sells its labor as a commodity. It's the only property it owns to sell uh, always gets to be like forced down into this place where that's it. That's all it has is its ability to sell labor and everything it makes in wages are consumed uh, it, it, sort of buying the things it needs uh, to survive and reproduce this specific form of society, this class uh, antagonism developing between these two bit over this property is a reflection of the division of labor that Carlos was just talking about, right? The way we are producing things and the way value itself has to accumulate is a contradiction. The, the, the struggle between bourgeoisie and proletariat is a reflection of that in people, in social relations, right? So what makes humanity humanity, right? It's our ability to perform labor, our ability to look at a thing, an apple, and say, if I pick an, that apple off that tree, perform labor, I get something from it. I've changed nature and, and developed something, right? This turns into agriculture, blah, blah, blah. It even starts us growing thumbs using language. What makes us human is labor. We come to this era where this is necessarily alienated from us. When we do this labor, the result of that is by rights, the property of another individual, right? Uh, when the value created by this labor is realized, is made real in money, someone else owns it, right? And so you get this contest between the two for the the, the sort of uh, proceeds of that. And Carlos has written an entire class out on this, so uh, I'm going to let him explain it more in detail and just sort of chime in. But I want to make sure um, before we get to that, we're at just over 900 viewers right now, y'all. So I want everybody to take one minute, like, and share the, the stream right now. Do it right now. It'll take two seconds. Let's get to over 1K. Let's break a record tonight. Uh, yeah. I think that would be cool. Let's shove it in Google Space that, uh, you know, them demonetizing us ain't going to stop us. Oh, absolutely. No, this is beautiful to see. And uh, thank you uh, to Chance. Um, uh, who has donated again, Chance Pope. Thank you so much, comrade. Uh, they asked, how do you think land ownership should change? Is there any inherent issue with someone owning small slash medium amounts of land around 200 to 300 acres per land? Well, my friend, what was the slogan of the Bolsheviks? Peace, land, and bread. So um, <laughs> give the people their land. Uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, people owning land. Now, if we're talking about these massive lands where you know, you're exploiting uh, a whole lot of people in order to uh, continue accumulating capital for for yourself, then you know there there, there might be a, a problem. But um, if it's just uh, you know farmers with a relatively decent amount of land that they can then take the the produces of and sell in their in their community and local markets, 
there ain't nothing capitalist uh, uh, about that or incompatible with uh, socialism as the dominant mode of production of a specific uh, form of life. But thank you so much, Chance, for another uh, $25 uh, donations. Um, I, I wanted to, to note that uh, for Marx and Engels, um, there's something, uh, for, first of all, the capitalist system is, is uh, to a certain extent from the lens of universal history. It is a progressive development. It does come in and uh, remove a lot of the feudal absolutisms uh, that had existed prior, uh, a lot of the explicit hierarchies of being, hierarchies of, of human beings that had existed uh, under, under feudalism, um, the aristocracies and uh, these, um, th these ways of handing down di different forms of privileges across uh, generations. Uh, it, it does do away with that, but it also produces the sort of what Domenico Lozordo calls a paradoxical twin birth, where on the one hand, it's, it's, it's fighting against feudal absolutism. On the other hand, it's one of the major proponents in bringing back and expanding slavery and in genociding uh, indigenous populations in order to accumulate its end. So again, we have here a contradiction. We can't fear contradictions or hold fast to one or the other side of the opposition that a contradiction represents. We have to see it as a contradiction. Don't be scared to see objective contradictions as such in your thinking. That's a great flaw of uh, the history of Western thought that I think thinkers like Heraclitus, Hegel, and then the Marxist tradition, the best parts of it have been able to overcome. So one of the things that Marx and Engels notice is that in contrast to all previous ruling classes, the capitalist class has an impetus on the basis of the nature of capital as necessarily to accumulate to develop constantly the forces of production, uh, one Jewish of the central state. metrics, one of the central metrics through which we can judge the progress of humanity. Because the more developed the forces of production, the less work we have to do, the more secure we are in producing the things that society needs. Um, it also develops to a certain extent the relations of productions. It removes again in removing some of these feudal absolutisms. It removes various forms of feudal oppressions uh, that that we consider to be quite negative. Um, it, it, it also has, to a certain extent, to use a, a term we, we a lot of people employ today, um, somewhat within the Marxist tradition, but, but not really, it has globalized life to a certain extent. Uh, it's exported its mode of production, consumption, and, and cultural and intellectual life to the farthest corners of the earth, or at least it has attempted the, the best it can to do so, usually under uh, the justification of civilizing. Uh, these various areas. Um, uh, for this, colonialism and later modern imperialism and neocolonialism have been central moments in the capitalist form of life's development. It has attempted to create, as we mentioned earlier, a, a world in its own image where national relations of exploitation and dependency reflect similar struggles to those which occur between the exploited and the exploiters within nations. So this is a component that our friend uh, uh, and political economist Radhika Desai has been developing on, the materiality of nations, the character of, of, of national struggles as class struggles. This is already in the young Marx. She quotes a lot the, uh, the Grundrisse and the certain debates that Marx was engaging with there, where he makes it very explicit. Um, but here Marx and Engels are, are extremely explicit about the fact that these, these national struggles are class struggles and, and they're reflections in many ways of the struggles between the exploited and the exploiters that occur within uh, nations themselves. Yeah, um, it's it's something that again, a lot of the falsifications and distortions that have sort of piled up in our country over the last period of history lead people to misconceptions on all the hip bourgeois theorists these days that go around pretending to be Marxist that some people will um, grant the title of even Western Marxism to, but I, I won't. <laughs> um, they, they think along these lines that there is only, they can't understand form and content. They can't understand universal and particular. And these are essential parts of Marxist methodology. You cannot ascend to the concrete on any topic. You cannot have a concrete, concept held in your mind if you don't understand the relationship between universal and particular and so they end up like modern trotsky's right they can't understand 
um, that, you know, this nation's uh, class struggle takes one form. That nation's takes another. For them, class struggle is one form of one thing at all times. It is only, uh, you know, a class sort of cognizing and becoming class conscious and struggling specifically for economic ends, which Lenin will later on call narrow economism, right? It cannot be the struggle against the color line, which if we look under all the labels and thinking and whatnot, we see a struggle of a working class, right? Taking a historically determined anti-racist form against a ruling class, right? It wasn't against other sections of the proletariat who took different sides in it, right? The most advanced sections led the way, the black proletariat. And then parts of the white proletariat join in, right? Because they recognize the struggles as aligned or as class struggles, like the Communist Party USA. But it was overall a struggle against the ruling class, always. The end of the Civil War destroys the slaveocracy. The struggle of the civil rights movement that ends in the civil rights revolution, which is technically what we call a political revolution rather than a whole social revolution that changes, you know, all of society from, from the social level. Anyway, um, this is a class struggle, right? A struggle of working class people against a ruling class, against that bourgeoisie. And today, when uh, America has sort of, or the United States, the American people have become so much more the American people than we were in those days, right? The united struggle for socialism, for communism, is on, not on the horizon anymore, but smack dab in front of us, right? And if we can understand precisely what Marx is explaining to us, well, what Carlos is explaining to us that Marx is saying here, we can understand the form that has to take in our era rather than being stuck in this definition mongering of class struggle is this, uh, ethnic struggle is that, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, very well said. Um, and uh, this historicizing, which is always omitted in these uh, amnesified, not sure if that's a term, but as a philosopher, we have the little card that lets us, lets us make up words. You got to um, end, end the word with ality and you're fine. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Amnesiality. Um, uh, as we mentioned, but these uh, bourgeois theorists, even those that are working within the, the tradition of, of classical political economy, which Marx respected, uh, let alone the vulgar economists, uh, which resemble a whole lot more neoclassical economics, just a religion used to justify um, capitalism in its whatever stage it's it's in. Um they are very adverse to history because history shows something very clearly, which is that capitalism is not eternal. It is a product of history itself. Um, and that in the same way that previous forms of life developed uh, and then undeveloped and gave way to new forms of life, so too capitalism is doing that. And you can analyze this scientifically. And precisely what Marxism does when it applies the philosophy, dialectical materialism, to the sphere of history and human society is find these laws of motion of human society that allow us to understand, to make sense of, to explain previous historical developments, and also to see certain trajectories. Not to make predictions with a magic eight ball about what the future is going to look like, but to have uh, educated guesses and hypotheses on the basis of this historical knowledge and on the basis of a concrete understanding of the present situation of how history is going to move forward. Um, so he starts by showing us how the contradictions of, of feudalism gave way for capitalism, how in another way, uh, capitalism was in the womb of feudalism and, uh, feudalism gave birth to capitalism in some ways. Likewise, socialism is already in the womb of capitalism. Um, and, and, and within the contradictions of capitalism itself, uh, we can see a embryonic form 
uh, of, of, of socialism or the potential, an embryonic potential for socialism arising. Socialism is not, as the utopians supposed, uh, this activity where these uh, well-spirited, moral individuals, enlightened individuals create a new world in their mind and then try to convince everyone and use benevolent bourgeois donations to create a, a, a sort of commune that then the rest of the world somehow emulates. That's not how uh, Marx and Engels are, are thinking about socialism. They're scientific socialists. So they're understanding socialism as a real potential that exists uh, not in, in, in our heads necessarily, but already in the form of life itself. And we can understand it in the mind precisely because it is objectively already present. That potential is already objectively present in the mode of life itself. So this is made evident in the contradictions that the system displays. Specifically, it's seen in the obstacles or the fetters, which is a great word uh, often used by, by our tradition, that the capitalist relations of production place upon the development of the productive forces, which is one of the central metrics through which we can uh, measure human progress. For instance, how many projects which would be incredibly useful for humanity are not undertaken because they're just not profitable? Um, this is evident in a country like ours where we look around and our cities are crumbling. Uh, this part of the Midwest is literally called the Rust Belt because all productive industry um, is, is, is literally gone. And what we have are the, 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 the factories uh, that are haunting us and that are you know, rusting into non-existence. Um, and these are factories that are, that, are, that are needed, that could produce things that are essential for the communities. Um, uh, we also have the capacity to you know, fill every pothole, ensure that our, our streets look nice, that our infrastructure is developed in the highest tech, that we have great public transportation as China does. Um, we, we have the capacity to do that, just not within the confines of, of our system. Not uh, those, those taking forth those uh, leaps are no longer profitable for the capitalist class. Um, after the crisis of the 1970s, and this is something that the work of Radhika Desai, Alan Freeman and others shows very clearly, the capitalist class comes into this crisis in, in the 70s precisely because the rate of profit has just been plummeting, something that Marx is predicting already in the manifesto, but really fleshing out in the third volume of Capital. And Capital, as a relation that is centered on accumulation, uh, needs to be re reinvested in something. And if productive industry within the U.S. is not yielding, yielding the same profit rates as it did before, uh, it has two options. It can either go the speculative uh, financialized route and obtain its profits on the basis of stock buybacks, rents, uh, and interest, um, or it can uh, continue being a productive uh, capitalist, but export the industries abroad where they can pay uh, labor, uh, variable capital um, as little as possible and therefore increase the, um, the, the profit margins on the basis of uh, absolute surplus exploitation done not to the same working class, but to a working class uh, abroad. So um, we literally cannot have the nice things which a modern society could have precisely because of the profit motive. This is a very clear example of how the relations of production, the dominant forms of intercourse become a fetter, become an obstacle to human progress. How many great things can we be making if it wasn't the case that the sole consideration, the bottom line, as Americans are fond of labeling it, uh, in all economic decisions, uh, if, if it wasn't profit, how many wonderful things could we be making for humanity? How bad are we stifling the potential of humanity by having the profit motive as the sole, almost godlike consideration behind any form of social calculation? So this is in the same way that uh, feudalism showed these contradictions, capitalism is showing them quite evidently as well in these various different forms. And not only that, um, we're getting to the point now in 2024 where um, financialization and this sort of abstraction of, of speculation has reached such a point, such a point that speculation and not the embodiment of value within a commodity which we then sell which will be industrial production right that is what the primary mode of capital accumulation is speculation um 
to say this is a, a disaster for an economy is to completely understate what a disaster is, right? There's a reason that Cleveland, for example, is falling apart, right? Where there's a literal joke that you can buy a house for the price of a VCR because that house ain't worth nothing. And nobody even knows what a VCR is anymore, right? You get them in a junkyard in our era. But that's where we're at. And not only that, like, we don't have to go into why houses have only become bank debts, right? Uh, or that most Americans are in debt. And this debt has become another primary form of accumulation rather than commodity production. This is because that rate of profit that they're, that they're doing this at, with every crisis, falls and falls and falls and falls and falls. And it's gotten to such a low point where it's not worth it anymore. And the algorithms and technology that uh, sort of must advance in order for them to continue accumulating have gotten so advanced that we get AI and this AI begins speculating for them, right? What we're witnessing, and I explain this in the short book on reproletarianization, is the relations of production, our boss and worker relationship being outmoded by the forces of production, by full financialization, globalization of industry, and the AI technology revolution, right? We're joking about everything being a revolution, but this is a full turnaround. I'm trying to use the word correctly here. And this brings on all of the revolutionary potential of our era. What we were talking about earlier, the, the, the sort of different forms of class struggle, they lead us into this era, right? To a point where um, we're not segregated, where I grew up in the black neighborhood, right? That was always traditionary, traditionally black, uh, rather than split off from my fellow working class Americans, right? We're all closer together now. We're all more American than ever before in history, specifically at this point in time where we're entering this revolutionary situation where the old relations of production are no longer making sense and something new is beginning to form. What we, what it could be, we, we don't even know yet, but if the working class can't organize itself in order to like bring it forward and keep progressing these forces of production, it's going to be a disaster. It can't but be a disaster. That's when people start talking about fascism. Fascism isn't, um, you know, Republicans or conservatives or anything silly like that. Fascism is the ruling class knowing it's unable to continue going on in the old way and going to extremes to stop us. Yeah, and specifically the the finance capital is part of the ruling class, which is uh, easily the most uh, parasitic um, and the one that represents the highest development of, of, of capital. Uh, by the way, folks, we're at 982 uh, viewers, so we're about to hit the thousand mark. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, like subscribe comment if not you know share it around so that uh, we can get this bad boy to a thousand i think it would be the first time in the institute's history that we've been able to make a thousand viewers on a live stream 17 um, more that's all we need 16 now <laughs> oh but, maybe um, i should talk less so more people will watch <laughs> no the uh where marks and angles go in terms of analyzing one of the clearest example of, uh, of this contradiction is the crisis of overproduction, uh, the cyclical crises of capitalism that intensify as they come and go. And this is something that has just been you know, generally accepted that every eight to 10 years, we have a system that just completely collapses for the vast majority of people. And that creates conditions such that when that collapse happens, the big banks come in and just buy more and more and more and get bigger and bigger and bigger to the point where uh, today you look at uh, investment firms and, and, and banks and they literally own everything, including each other. So it becomes very evident 
um, that there is a class interest there and an explicit interest for um, the other people within their class to succeed because they own them as well and the others own uh, them. So it's a um, it's quite explicit. But for Marx and Engels, these crises of overproduction where people starve and or, or, or are unhoused literally while food is being thrown out or while houses uh, are, are left unoccupied, you know, we have 36 times more empty houses than we have homeless people here in the U.S. That's a, you know, ridiculous statistic. It's completely irrational. Um, this is a permanent and cyclical reality of the capitalist form of life. For the first time in human history, want, necessity, is not based on the absence of goods, but on their overproduction within the existing social relations. So uh, capitalism bandages these crises or tries to by searching for new markets, so imperial conquest, or by throwing away goods or destroying means of productions uh, themselves, which is uh, an increasing reality we're seeing here in the US. I had a student um, talk to me in office hours last semester uh, that at his job, because no one was buying anything, and I, I forget what it was, but it was something that people needed, an essential thing, uh, they started just throwing away some of the things that they produced. Um, this has been a reality all throughout the capitalist mode of life, and it's completely absurd how you can have on the one side a mass of people in tremendous need for something that on the other side they cannot obtain simply because uh, they have to pay for it and they don't have the means. They literally produce those things. It is the working class that produces these things. And if the capitalist class cannot profit from them, uh, the working class is left to starve and die. So there's this great quote from the manifesto that I want to um, read real quick. Uh, Can I say something way, real quick before yeah, that? Go ahead. Um, we are taught to think about that backwards. We right. are taught to think that um, they don't owe you anything, blah, 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 right? Which is true. Uh, one man doesn't owe another man anything just because, right? But what they are doing in certain circumstances is holding for ransom your liberty, mm -hmm. your freedom, your ability to live. The bourgeois rights that were enshrined in the American Bill of Rights, they are in a clear clear dereliction of duty right we are in america we're supposed to have a right to life liberty and the pursuit of happiness our right to life is ransomed to us by giant uh insurance cartels by giant firms that sell us health care health care they sell us pills that are temporary solutions to problems they want to continue so they can keep selling us pills, right? Our right to liberty, we must sell it in order to survive, to pay them again for yeah. the things we need. That is not liberty, my friends. What about our pursuit of happiness? Well, that's tied up with liberty. If we have no liberty, we are not free to pursue that happiness. And so these fundamental rights that they say, they say, not us, are give, endowed to us from our creator, right? Um, that we are all equal, created equal, they say. But this is not equality. This is not a right to any of that, right? How are we equal if you take everything before we're even born, right? And then we must work for you to make you rich in order to get tiny little pieces of liberty here and there, maybe a tiny sliver of happiness when I get married, right? Maybe a tiny, tiny little bit of life when that pill does its job for a, a half hour. That's well, beautiful. Let's get started on the, the, the tax on free speech. We'll be our own yeah. night. I just want to point out that that's uh, inherent within the commun Communist Manifesto is a criticism of all of this. Yeah, and it's important to uh, note that these gaps between the enunciated values of bourgeois society and the reality, they're not rooted in, oh, this government is bad, that government is bad, if only we elect a new person, or if only the individuals are better. The gap 
the error, the mistake is objectively in the world itself. That's the essence of bourgeois ideology qua false consciousness, as false consciousness, that the inversions of the world that we find when we reflect upon how the bourgeoisie asks us to think about its own order, those inversions are not epistemological mistakes, problems of epistemic hygiene. Uh, they are objectively rooted. They, it's a social order that needs systematically, in order to reproduce itself, people to understand that order in incorrect and topsy-turvy ways. Um, and it's very clear when you look at uh, the values enunciated by the American Revolution and others that the reality has been far from it, that that blank check has been a check, as uh, MLK said, uh, that has been given to all of society. The vast majority of working people have received the blank check. The promises of the revolution have never been fulfilled. And that's a rational kernel that we can take up and say, well, what is the rational kernel here? What is the, the point of contact? that we communists can find in these values that the people already accept, but that they feel unrealized in their modes, uh, their contemporary modes of life. And how can we show them the impossibility of those values being realized under capitalist social relations and the uh, only uh, possibility of their realization being within a socialist mode of production, a form of life in which it is working people, uh, the demos that actually has power. In other words, Kratos. So real democracy, which is synonymous with uh, socialism. But I wanted to pull up a by quote. By and for the people. By and for, of by and for the people. I wanted to pull up a quote here from Marx and Engels. Um, Society suddenly finds itself back into a state of momentary barbarism. So he's speaking about these crises of overproduction. It appears as if a famine, a universal war of devastation, had cut off the supply of every means of subsistence, industry, and commerce seem to, to be destroyed. And why? Because there is too much civilization. He's using their terms, you know, ironically, cynically. Too much means of subsistence, too much industry, too much commerce. The productive forces at the disposal of society no longer tend to further the development of the conditions of bourgeois property. On the contrary, they have become too powerful for these conditions. So, Bourgeois relations have become a fetter, an obstacle to the development of the forces of production by which they are fettered. And so soon as they become overcome these fetters, they bring disorder into the whole of bourgeois society and danger the existence of bourgeois property. The conditions of bourgeois society are too narrow to comprise the wealth created by them. And how does the bourgeoisie get over these crises? On the one hand, by enforced destruction of mass productive forces, on the other hand, by the conquest of new markets, and by the more, uh, and, and by the more through exploitation of these old ones. That is to say, by paving the way for more extensive and more destructive crises, and by diminishing the means whereby crises are prevented. So they prevent the crisis from breaking completely the system, precisely by doing what is necessary to make the next crisis even worse. It is a fundamentally unsustainable system. And just like the slave owners in one part of history thought this order is going to last forever, and then the feudal lords thought this order was going to last forever, and then the divine, uh, supposedly divinely endowed uh, power of the kings, the kings thought their power, if it was divinely endowed, was never going to go away. So too do the capitalists today assume that the capitalist mode of life, uh, centered and, 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 and founded and grounded, on wage slavery, because it's what it is, wage slavery. They think it's going to last forever. And we, the students of history, those who have the science of Marxism that enlightens us to these movements of history, we know that they are very foolish and infantile in thinking so. You ever hear when they talk about our, our politicians, uh, they say that they kick the can down the road? This is precisely what they're doing. Right. Every single time. This is what financialization was. Right. They had sort of two roads they could have gone down after the crisis in the early 70s that sort of really accelerates in 72. Um, they could either begin financialization uh, at a new rate with austerity and and sort of what they called neoliberalism. Right. Or they could go down the sort of Keynesian 
uh, balance program, right? And in order to protect their system from the threat of class struggle, they chose the form. And these were the, the sort of debates going on within the bourgeois class of the day. And uh, we see the devastation it causes. Now they kicked the can down the road and we get to now, right? We get to a point where the city I'm from, Cleveland, there is over a 90% functional illiteracy rate in adults, right? They need us dumb. The, 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 the deterioration caused by all of this is sort of finally getting to a place where they can't kick the can down the road anymore. And this, Marx is going to teach us, is uh, what produces a revolutionary situation. But before we uh, want to get to that, or we get to that, I want to say we just broke our record for most viewers at one time. We're at over a thousand viewers now, so thank all of y'all. Uh, I just got to mention, Google AdSense has demonetized us without bothering telling us why. We're pretty sure we think it's because we stand against Nazism, against banderism, and the proxy war they're waging against Russia. Uh, but who knows? They refuse to tell us so far. Uh, so if you want to help support the Institute, by all means, there are ways to do so. Check out patreon.com slash Midwestern Marks. Uh, Carlos is going to put a link for the PayPal. You can uh, donate to us there, whatever you want to do. Every little bit is super appreciated. We get zero funding from anyone. We are a 100% uh, people-funded institute. Everything we do is solely provided for by you guys. This fancy microphone I got. Thank you all. Now you can hear me properly. <laughs> um, and speaking of, uh, of that, join the Discord. It's public yeah. now. Uh, we're going to be doing a lot of great stuff around that uh, because it's just very dynamic software. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to be doing a new Basics of Marxism class before the month is out, which hopefully we'll be able to organize with the Discord so we're not limited by the amount of people in a Zoom call, right? Um, if 200 people sign up, 200 people get in the class. So, uh, yeah, every announcement we do will always be on the Discord, all that. Check it out. So, yeah, I want to to go back to this, though. I want to talk for a moment about um, the other effects of capitalism, right? Besides just producing all these crises and kicking the can down the road, leading us to what we have now, it does a few other things that also lead us to now, right? And I love, uh, the, the, basically, it centralizes everything, right? Uh, talk about the, the people who want decentralization, they're anarchists, but also, you know, capitalism, that can't happen. You cannot have capital accumulation without centralized power, without a centralized monetary system, right? Uh, it centralizes the means of production over and over again in fewer and fewer hands. If you ever hear us talking about, you know, the cartels, the trusts, uh, the, the elites, the bourgeoisie, whatever, this is the handful of ruling people left with real capital. So it does all this, right? Uh, it, it even centralizes politics, right? Democrat, Republican. What we do then is just take it back. I don't know. I, we can go into what Marx has to say about it, but I, I wanted to make sure we got that out before we moved on. Um, yeah. That's part of how capitalism creates the conditions for socialism. Because precisely. socialism would utilize all of this centralization, but instead of the ends uh, being for capital accumulation in the hands of a few people, um, the ends would be uh, clearly employed for the benefit of the vast majority of humanity, which are working people. Right. Well, the, the proletariat sort of um, develops as a class through 
the contradictions inherent within this process happening. Right. Right. And this is what I was sort of getting to. Carlos is amazing and one of the best organizers ever and put down like a list of notes just so I'm always on the same page as him for this. And this is what we're going to get, get into next. But I want to, before we get to that, go into um, the fact that this proletariat, right, as it develops, changes, right? Um, in the U.S. Uh, condition, regarding financialization, what we have, what we see happening is something that had never happened before in history. We start developing a middle class out of that proletariat, which all of the more dogmatic Marxists of the last period of history would consider impossible because they're going by these definitions. And if they can't memorize a conclusion of Marx, then they have no explanation for it. Right. But we get working class people that accumulate something beyond being able to just subsist and reproduce that particular form of society. They lose their proletarian character at this time. When we talk about the process of reproletarianization, it is people, working class people in our era, regaining this character, right? Regaining, the, regaining this direct contradiction. The can has been kicked all the way down the road. And they're up against a place where they're back in this situation where it's revolution or nothing. It's socialism or barbarism, as Rosa Luxemburg said, right? Um, but, but what is the proletariat then, right? It's this class who can wield and develop the forces of production uh, in a way that removes those obstacles that Carlos was talking about. He'll, he'll explain it better than me. Go ahead, brother. Well, in the same way that uh, feudalism had uh, set certain fetters, uh, obstacles for the development of the productive forces, obstacles which only the bourgeoisie uh, as the developed class of the time could overcome um, by the very fact that uh, it's, its relations, uh, the forms of intercourse that it is engaged with were compatible with those developments. Likewise, now, um, it is only the working class that can help us overcome the obstacles which capitalist, capitalist forms of intercourse have created for the development of the productive forces. This doesn't mean you know, being better at mass producing junk that's then thrown out, uh, as we see in today's capitalism, where we produce an abundance of literal bullshit, um, excuse my French, that's just thrown out. We have things like fast fashion. Uh, us removing the fetters uh, that capitalist relations of production place on the forces of production doesn't mean that we're better at becoming a system of waste, a system of just making endless bullshit that gets thrown out um, where we're all hyper consumerist and, and we just want Fidget more and more, more. <laughs> Fidget spinners, right. Um, it means that we can produce more efficiently. We can produce more efficiently and produce for the sake of creating a certain type of abundance, an abundance that gives people the security uh, to have what they need in order to live, live flourishing, uh, virtue guided uh, lives that are, as Che would say, more fully human because they have the capacity to embody and develop upon the characteristics uh, that are the most unique to humanity, our creative characteristics that, that Noah was uh, developing uh, on earlier. Um, I've written in, in some of my previous works how, how this is, in many ways, an Aristotelian project, an attempt to create the conditions for the possibility socially um, through the oikonomia, uh, the classical term for economy, um, that uh, pro uh, uh, promote the greatest amount of, flour of human flourishing, the conditions for the greatest amount of human flourishing, which of course requires planning, removing the anarchy of, of the market or the anarchy of capitalist planning that's only for profits um, and producing in as efficient a way as possible where the priority is meeting people's needs uh, and not making a, a small group of people uh, rich. So the next section of, of the first chapter deals a little bit more with the uh, dynamics that are then expanded um, as they've never been before in, in, in the three 
actually four volumes of capital, which is how surplus value is extracted from, from the working class. But um, I saw that you had pulled up a, a comment there. Um, oh, do we yeah. wanna, I hadn't read it, so I don't know if we want to address that before we go. I mean, it's it's not a, a big deal. It's, it was just very good that uh, precisely, Wayne, um, definition mongering is what we call this, right? Where they just have a static set in stone definition of anything that fits all time and places. And it's really just a, a, a not understanding Marxism and the Marxist view of how we look at any subject they're talking about, especially when we're talking about socialism. In his Collective Works, Volume 45, which is a collection of letters, I forget which letter it is, um, Lenin even says that this is a, a childish argument to have, right? What what will communism be? What will socialism be? It's, it's just what it is. What it looks like is what it ends up looking like, right? right. And actually, one of the next parts that, that Marx gets to in the manifesto sort of deals with this, right? That uh, just as capitalism developed within that womb of feudalism, socialism is developing within the womb of capitalism, right? But each capitalist country does not look the same. They have different traditions, different cultures, different needs, different challenges, different ways of uh, meeting those challenges. So uh, the reason the Chinese call their, their, their system socialism with Chinese characteristics is because uh, it has Chinese characteristics, right? Chinese socialism doesn't look like Soviet socialism did. American socialism won't look like either. It'll be based in American struggles, right? The, um, the challenges our country and our people face, the form our revolution will take. Absolutely. Um... Marx is going to transition in, in the end of the first mm -hmm. chapter of the manifesto. Marx and Engels, I keep saying just Marx. Um, we could just say discussion. Engels from now on. <laughs> just switch good, it up, good. you know. Terrell Carver would be proud. Mm -hmm. um, so the discussion of how surplus value is, is created and, and to a focus that's more centered on the working class itself. Um, the modern worker, i.e. the proletariat, uh, develops as a class through the intensification of these contradictions. Um, it is a class, as we mentioned, that has a capacity to uh, move along uh, the forces of production that are being stifled by uh, the bourgeoisie. It is a class that can only survive insofar as it can sell its labor power in the market. This is an important distinction that solves the, um, you know, the central paradoxes of classical political economy. It's labor power that's bought and sold. Um, it, is, it is not labor itself. It is a capacity that people have to work. And I'm doing a research paper on this, so uh, look out more. Uh, look, look out for that in, in the future. Um, the exchange value, we know that uh, you know, commodity production is contradictory value production. It's a contradiction because it contains its unity of opposites within it. Uh, and labor power as a commodity like others, also contains uh, these two essential opposing poles, uh, the use value, which is hidden uh, by the exchange value. The exchange value of uh, labor power is simply what is needed in order to reproduce the worker and their kin. So what's needed in order to bring back the working class to continue being exploited and continue to produce profits for the capitalist class, which as a living organism means that uh, it's the means of subsistence, however much is needed for this class to physically survive. That is going to be the exchange value of that labor, of, of labor power. The use value, of course, for the capitalist, uh, which is the one buying it, is found in the fact that labor power is the only commodity that is not only a source of value, as Marx writes in Capital Volume 1, but of more value than it has itself. That is, without going too deep into the analysis that he fleshes out in the first volume of Capital, for the capitalist, the use, uh, the use value of that labor power is found in its ability to produce surplus value. That is, for the worker to work well beyond the hours in which he produces or they produce, let's be a little bit more woke here, <laughs> in which they produce the amount of value uh, their labor was bought for. 
<laughs> you gotta stop laughing. You're you're only I'm gonna yeah. <laughs> the amount of hours they produce the 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 equivalent of of a value that the labor power was bought for. In these hours, in which the worker produces something new out of the materials they work on, they create the foundation for what eventually gets realized once it enters uh, the moment of circulation as a profit for the capitalists later on. Okay, stop being a degenerate and go, <laughs> go <laughs> provide your comments without laughing. <laughs> Yeah, so I can. What happens is that when when the 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 worker uh, applies their labor when they do this right uh, over an entire industry making a thing right, they imbue the commodity being produced with value, right? All of the materials, right? All of the labor. Uh, that goes into and, and the cost of the means to produce everything that goes into making this co commodity, right? It when when the value of that commodity is necessarily higher than all of that. The difference between all of those is the surplus, what we call the surplus value, right? And it's the secret of understand a secret, the 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 knowledge of understanding. How this surplus value comes about, uh, what alienated labor is, which is a value, um, that makes the, uh, the, the fact of exploitation so solid for us, right? That everything is, a, uh, that, that is founded upon this of our ability to understand material reality, because what Marx is actually doing throughout capital, and not this, is ascending to the concrete and showing this realization of value, more value, right? Through that labor as a property of someone else, the property of the bourgeoisie. There's something I say all the time that every single working class person gets whenever I say it to them. They go, hey, how you doing? I go, I'm tired, right? And they go, oh, blah, 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 blah me too. I'm like, yeah, that's what happens. Because we spend all day making somebody else rich. Yep. And that's all there is to it. The secret of surplus value. I don't know why I keep saying secret. Um, the, the understanding of surplus value is why we make them rich and not us. Precisely. And that's one of the central questions that political economy, classical political economy, Smith, Ricardo, Petty, um, was not able to answer um, precisely because they understood that what was being bought as a commodity was labor and not labor power. So they weren't able to see that in the capacity of the worker to exert himself uh, far uh, longer in terms of working hours from the amount of value that they were bought for, um, you have uh, the, you know, this uh, um, quant qualitative leap into what's being produced uh, being surplus value, uh, which of course then gets uh, the potential for, for being realized as, as profit. Yeah, um, and Ricardo couldn't really understand that money itself is a contradiction, right? right. And the realization of value, is, is that's a whole nother bag of bananas though. Right, um, so this, uh, this process happens, uh, it's one that the capitalists describe as a consensual contract. Um, we sell our labor power and we consent to selling it. But in reality, it's rooted in a form of economic power and a form of mute compulsion, which is the phrase that, that Marx uses in some translations. It's silent compulsion. But it's this unovert, unexplicit form of power that exerts itself over us and that forces us to participate in, 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 in markets, uh, through selling our, our labor power. And it's very simple. I mean, we can throw around these terms like mute compulsion, which are a little bit uh, you know, complex. But what it means is that if you're born into a working class family and you're coming of age, uh, you cannot survive if you don't work. How are you gonna pay rent? How are you gonna eat? How are you gonna have the basics that you need to, you can't survive unless you sell your labor power. That right might not be liberty in pursuit of happiness or held ransom. Right. So that might not be the explicit 
violence of someone with a gun coming to your house and telling you, you have to work, but it's, it's a form of power that's being constantly exerted in ways that um, far uh, uh, supersede any form of mute compulsion, mute uh, economic power that we've seen in other previous forms of life. And the sort of work that we're forced to do is often degrading. It's often dehumanizing, alienating, right? Um, it is stupefying work that leaves us feeling as if we're just a cog in a, in a machine, very mechanistic, repetitive, and it stifles our, our humanity. Um, this, this, this current that, that Marx, uh, that, that Marx, that, uh, block, or Ernst Block called the warm current of, of Marxism is still there. You know, when we speak about exploitation, we're speaking about something which could be scientifically calculated, um, and it, and is calculated by Marx and is calculated by Marxist political economists today. Uh, but that also has that warmer human component, the fact that we're, we're exploited, but we're also precisely because we're exploited, um, and by virtue of fact that we're exploited, we're alienated um, and vice versa as well. And uh, we're degraded, we're dehumanized. All of these at the human level are extremely impactful um, and are important vessels of motivations for fighting for socialism, which would be a much more humanizing system, a system where we're not alienating, alienated from the products that we make, from the process of production, from other human beings. We're not alienated from nature, nor are we alienated from what it really means to be a human being our species essence, our, our Gattungsvesen, um, our unique ability to imbue, uh, objectify ourselves onto nature and uh, do so creatively, do so uh, with a form of, of planned conscious, uh, a conscious life activity that can also imbue certain standards of, of beauty, certain aesthetics, uh, aesthetic principles onto nature for enjoyment, not just for the sake of surviving like many other animals that actually work uh, do. So, um, one of the interesting things about uh, the capitalist system is that you have these paradoxes where technology might develop. It might allow you to produce what you previously produced in eight hours and four. But does that mean that we work less? Does that mean that as it should in a rational society, that the necessary labor time is decreased so that we have more of what the philosopher Martin Hoglan has called socially available free time to you know, be creative human beings? No. It's often the opposite. Working people are scared shitless of, you know, what's called automation precisely because it means they know that it means more precarious conditions for them. Um, and that under this irrational system, all it produces is barbaric outcomes for a development that should be seen as objectively a progressive development for humanity, something that should allow us to work less and have more free time and, and, and you know, enjoy the things that really make us human beings. Yeah. And that's, uh, one of the last uh, things that 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 Marx ever writes, uh, he, he sort of he doesn't really delve into it, but he talks about uh, a, a, just a theoretical example of this future society, right? Where um, we are, w w the technology has progressed to a point where there is this abundance, where you don't need to be limited by selling your labor. Or to a capitalist your whole life, or spending eight hours a day making other people rich, right? Um, we don't need to, you know, be jargony about it. We can just be real about it like that. And when you're real about it like that, people get it, right? Every every person I've ever said that to, it's like, yeah, you're right. We shouldn't be doing that. I want to make myself rich. Of course you do. Everybody does. Um, I think though. At the end of the day, uh, as Marx teaches us, capitalism is creating its own grave diggers, right? Um, and that's us. I'll, I'll, I'll let you sort of finish off the thing. Uh, but what I just wanted to say before uh, we do that it's been a great night. Um, we're at just about 1,100 uh, viewers right now. And thank you to everybody watching. I sorry, I lost my train of thought. I what is I was gonna say something else, but yeah, go ahead, brother. It is extremely late for 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 Noah. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm sorry. We had a few hours of frustration to trying to uh, figure out the other streaming platform, but yeah. Um, if, just, <laughs> if you didn't notice, the thumbnail says five, uh, but yeah. we had some technical difficulties. 
we usually don't go this late. I'm awake every day at like four. Uh, to work. Late, so, yeah. To actually uh, p participate in, in the exploitative and dehumanizing activity, which we're speaking about today, trying to make sense of and uh, make sense of precisely for the sake of trying to overcome it. That's uh, one of the central distinctions between Marx's philosophy and all else. Uh, it's not just about interpreting or the world or keeping it how it is. It's about changing it in a revolutionary manner um, as we understand it better and using that enhanced understanding of the world to change it. Um, one of the things that must be understood when we think about it in terms of class in general is that the worker, they receive their wage um, for which they perform exploitative, dehumanizing, alienating labor for. But after they receive their wage, what happens with that? Can they just use it to, 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 to spend it on, you know, God knows what luxuries? No, they have to kick it back literally to the same capitalist class, the different parts of the capitalist class. They have to kick it back to capitalist landlords, to shopkeepers, um, and to banks, right? Today, the vast majority of people are in crippling uh, debt. Um, the phenomenon of debt, debt slavery is a common reality for most Americans. And Marx refers to it in the third volume of Capital as the, the secondary form of exploitation, the one that happens after the moment of production. Um, it's generalized today. So not only are we exploited, but the portion that is, is, is given to us, we literally have to give it back to, to, to the capitalists. So it's, it's an extremely um, uh, value-sucking, life-sucking uh, system that we live under. Everything, everything is leeches on top, mm -hmm. sucking our life out of us. They do it when we're working, and then when we're buying things to give ourselves like a slight little bit of happiness in the in the meantime before we have to work again um, yeah that's why he calls it a vampire precisely and that's what we were talking about earlier in the stream right when uh we said that they they hold our right to life liberty in the pursuit of happiness hostage right, right? if we want those things we got to pay them we got to work for them they're getting rich off us in one way and then we got to pay them again to buy these things with you know it's wild uh, and then they tell us we're lazy if we wanted to keep what we make right precisely and we it's, don't want people uh, leeching off us doing nothing and adding nothing to society it's crazy it's at a macro macro scale what a company town is yeah oh precisely That's precisely what it is not even um, not, not an exaggeration but uh here's the thing though as this all plays out over time, right? Um, the working class sort of recognizes what's happening more and more, right? There, that's why I can say that to anybody. Uh, say like we, you know, we spend all day making other people rich, and they get it right away, right? Uh, people understand on a sort of subconscious level that they're in an antagonistic relation to the capitalists and to the entire dominant mode of production, right? That's why we got trade unions, right? That was a sort of initial expression of class consciousness, but it's up to those who've already gotten there to sort of finish the job and bring it from that subconscious level where they just like, when you mention it, they go, oh yeah, to where they're saying it themselves. They're saying to others, we spend all day getting rich. Let's make ourselves rich. And that is precisely what the role of a communist party would be. A communist party is nothing else than a people's party, the most advanced detachment section of the working class, the part of the working class that has the most clarity as to the systematic source of the ills that working people live under and are subjected to under this tyrannical form of life. And then on the basis of that systematic understanding, understand how to move forward as well. And understand and, and know that it is only when the working class organizes itself in a revolutionary manner and fights for the conquest of political power that things can actually 
change. Sure, the struggle for reforms are important, but the communists is, is they who, as Marx and Engels mentioned at the beginning of the second chapter, have the long-term interests of the working class at heart and are constantly reminding the working class, one, of the international dimension of their struggles. Um, so there would be the imperialist element, um, the, the necessary role of anti-imperialism in these struggles, um, and of the understanding of the common cause that anti-imperialist struggles have with the class struggle that we have at home. And two, that are always reminding people that if we're not fighting ultimately for the conquest of political power, we're not genuinely having the long-term essential interests of the working class at heart. They are the ones, and this is why if you look at American history, the moments where the trade union movement was the most radical, was the most advanced, had the most confidence from regular working people, was the most successful in, in obtaining concessions from the capitalist class. It was those moments when it was led by the communist party and by communists. It was when communists led the trade unions that the most positive reforms came precisely because the struggle wasn't just for reforms, but reforms were used as a means to help us fight for the longer term goal, which is the conquest of political power by the working class, the establishment of a dictatorship of the proletariat, which is really a, a, a fancy way of just talking about democracy, of the people having power. And power is always relational. Power is not just something that functions in the abstract. Marx mentions this, Marx and Engels mention this very clearly, that power already presupposes the existence of, of classes. So the dictatorship of the proletariat or democracy as rule of the people, what it implies is that the people have the capacity, the power to oppress, to repress, to prevent those which are threatening the rule of the people, those reactionary forces which want to bring his, the wheel of history back and they want to return to an order where a small group of people were exploiting the vast majority of humanity, uh, living the leaving the vast majority of humanity in a degraded form of existence while they just leached off of them and, and lived, uh, lived their luxurious lives. So the point of the communists is to keep that end in mind. We're fighting for the conquest of state power so that we can abolish the state, which means remove the bourgeois state and establish a proletarian state. So for the libertarians that say communism is more state, no, 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 no. Fuck the bourgeois state. We don't like the bourgeois state. It's their state. We want an actual people's state, a state of the people. And that means reconstructing all of uh, the institutions in order so that they're, they're of, by, and for the people. And uh, that, uh, according to Marx and Engels, is going to be a reality for quite a bit of time. Um, the expropriation of the capitalist economic capital is going to be something that as they say, is going to be wrested by degree. If in the context, for instance, of China, the capitalist class can play somewhat of a progressive role in the development of the productive forces, we let them, but we don't let them come nowhere near to political power. We have to have a what Mao called a monopoly on political capital. We have to hold in our class's hands all of political capital, not let the capitalists come anywhere near it, even if we allow them to exist in a regulated and very... Um, controlled manner in terms of economic capital and used to serve the ends of socialism. Ride the tiger but, to serve the ends of socialism as China has done. My idea, I mean, and maybe I'm just crazy, is in order to hold office, you need to prove that you have calluses on your hands, right? <laughs> so nobody that's never done a day's work in their life, right? I, I'm joking, but no, Carlos is absolutely correct. Right, we, the the the, the entire uh, um, thing rests on our political supremacy as working class people, preventing anyone who uh, would would want to bring back the old order from gaining power, and that's it, uh, and that's our mission. And you know, for me. Um, I think it's something that uh, I think people always say not in our lifetime because they don't genuinely believe in it. But I believe in fighting in our lifetime and I'll die fighting. Um, <laughs> my God. Or if, uh, I, uh, I'm not even, I'm not going to show you, but it's gross. Um, <laughs> when you literally swing a hammer all day, they get bad. Uh, I guess some gym rats, they're sneaking in. 
as myself to, with calluses. Oh, no, true. I used to so, like my son when he was young used to complain that my hands were too scratchy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, um, thank you all for being with us tonight. It's been a fantastic uh, stream. We're going to do a part two for section two of the Communist Manifesto very soon, which will be announced in our Discord. If you haven't joined that yet, now that it's public, please do. We got some great moderators there. Uh, Kyle's there, Daniel's there, Sebastian's there. You'll love everybody there, trust me. Uh, I don't have the link, but Kyle will post it in the chat because he's on top of all that. Uh, remember that we've been demonetized because Google hates what we say, apparently. I'm joking. They haven't told us why. Uh, but because of that, please check us out at patreon.com slash MidwesternMarks. Check out our PayPal. Donate there. Uh, every single dime in our budget comes from you guys. And uh, stay tuned for more great stuff like this in the uh, near future. And thank you to the 1,100 of you who have stuck around with us, listened to us, learned with us, um, and who are educating yourself for this glorious fight that we have, a fight for humanity, because it's really, it's monsters that we're fighting against. It's a cancerous, life-devouring system, and it is our duty as communists to uh, bring humanity forward into a new, more hopeful, more human, more free, more democratic form of life. So uh, thank you all uh, for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Stand up, all victims of oppression, for the tyrants fear your mind. Don't cling so hard to your possessions, for you have nothing if you have no right. Let racist ignorance be ended, for respect makes the empires fall. Freedom is merely privilege extended, and less enjoyed by one and all. So come brothers and sisters, for the struggle carries on. The international unites the world in the song. So comrades, come rally, for this is the time and place. The international ideal unites the human race. Let no one build walls to divide us, walls of hatred and all walls of stone. Come greet the dawn and stand beside us, we'll live together or we'll die alone. In our world poisoned by exploitation, those who have taken now they must give. And end the vanity of nations, we've but one earth on which to live. So come brothers and sisters, for the struggle carries on. The international unites the world in the song. So comrades, come rally, for this is the time and place. The international ideal unites the human so begins the final drama in the streets and in the fields. We stand on before their armor, we defy their guns and shields. When we fight, provoked by their aggression, let us be inspired by life and love. For though they offer us concessions, change will not come from Brothers and sisters, for the struggle carries on. The international unites.